Okay, welcome back to our last session for um, AI and Intelligent Automation Live. Sorry, not our last session, our last session for day two. Um, I've been up a long time, sorry. <laughs> um, next up, we have a really exciting session to end the day off um, on embracing intelligent automation, um, a step change towards smarter operations. And, and what I've tried to do with this conference is bring you really practical discussions that you can go away and implement some of the takeaways um, as soon as you get back to your office. Um, so I'm hoping that this, this is one of them. Um, just a little bit um, of admin. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Sally Fletcher. I'm the head of online events for IQBC. I'm working with the AIIA network in putting this event together. Um, remember to join the conversation. So we want you to ask loads of great questions um, to our speaker today. Um, you can tweet um, using the hashtag AIIA live, um, or you can join um, in real time by visiting our chat rooms and our networking rooms um, where Hexaware have got a booth um, with lots of great info that you can pick up following the session. So our next topic is one we get a lot of um, requests for, embracing intelligent automation of a step change towards smarter operations. Um, and our speaker today um, is Mr. Pranav Rai. Um, just a little bit about Pranav. Um, he heads the Global Solutions and RPA Advisory Team at Hexware Technologies, um, capitalizing on Hexware's corporate theme, automate everything, cloudify everything, and transform customer experience. He aims to disrupt the BPS industry by offering innovative solutions, leveraging RPA, AI, and machine learning. Hexware's taken a journey of not being a me too organization in shared services, um, but rather focusing on upfront automation benefits um, to customers through digital managed service model. Um, this session, as I said, talks about intelligent automation, um, smart technologies like AI, machine learning, um, NLP and cognitive automation, um, and how they're heralding um, in larger benefits by enabling quicker decision making um, in the back office and improving customer experience. This session debates on how these technologies are augmenting human potential and catalyzing on that. Um, so yes, lots of great info. Um, I'm going to hand over to Pranav and his team to talk to us about embracing intelligent automation. Over to you, Pranav. Thanks, Sally. Thanks for the nice introduction. Hi, good afternoon, good evening and morning to everyone. This is Pranav here. So let me set the stage before I start. What is that you're going to hear from us? There are some of my colleagues, Satish, Vidhi, and the rest of the folks joining with me. We are trying to introduce RPA, MLA in a different form today. What we are thinking about is, you must, all of you are experts. You have been hearing a lot about AI ML. We will try to make it, how real is it? Is it real? Is it workable? There will be areas which are great, which we can't handle today, but maybe tomorrow we can address that. But in reality, what I'll try to bring in is, this is where we have to be. And believe you me, in the 22 years of this industry, I've been attached very closely. I have learned every phase of it step by step and still learning. So that's what we'll be trying to address it today. And then we'll have a 10 minutes Q&A part of it. So moving to slide two, which is called the pursuit of true intelligent automation. And the fact why I have brought this slide is not to introduce technology as such, but most of you have to be into this RPA journey. And considering I'll be focusing more on APAC and Europe and US will be a few of the past, but the majority of folks are from APAC, so I want to address that. RPA, as it is, it's a journey that most of you have taken. If not, it has to be. The fact is, it's not that people, process, technology, you must be hearing that every day. The reality is, as we have to have bread and butter or whatever, a breakfast in the morning, this is where RPA, ML, and AI will be a partner to us. It's a kind of a partnership which we have to live with it if we have to grow. And it's not the technologists who have to do it. It is the real business guys who are taking business decisions, who have to take calls to make it happen, is what we will be trying to address that part of it. And if you see the journey on this slide, that RPA, Somebody calls it dumb, somebody calls it useful, but the fact of the matter is, it does everything faster, cheaper. The fact is, dumb, we have done it for one and a half years, two years, what is next to be done? And once you have achieved it, there are areas when you start looking at it. And where is the industry moving? So there are companies like us, or there are many of, and today I'll be talking more from the entire fraternity, 
who have been investing time and money only to look into this aspect part of it. So jumping from that RPA stage, there is a phase which is called cognitive automation. And reality is the industry, there are a lot of partners available who have started this journey as a dumb model, then slowly have introduced cognition into that part of it and taken it to the step further, which is not conversational UI. And one example I would like to give here, which many of us may not have been aware of it earlier. We never thought that this Microsoft and Amazon, suppose AWS, who are actually competitors to each other, have to come and join hands today. Why? This is the reality. They have created an open source kind of a stuff, which is called Gluon. And if you can search on web, you'll come to know about it last year. What they decided is, we can't keep on just competing with each other. To make this AIML true, we have to allow people who can think loud, may not be experts in AI, but who can think about coding, who can write, who can think about business, they come on the face, they have an open source, they don't need to buy something or get uh, locked into an IP, but start writing solutions which are really usable, and it's happening today. So that is something which, if you ask me a year and a half, two years back, I may not have thought about it, that how can these two come into, but it is real and it is happening. Another example, which I would like to make it happen today, is all of us are aware of that Amazon Alexa is there, Google is available, Google Home is there, but we never thought that this will move towards the real end user element. What I mean is that initially it was that, okay, it will be home users, home users will, it's an exciting stuff, we'll take it, and this was the three years back story which I'm talking about. Today, in reality, every enterprise across the geography is now thinking, how do I embrace that into my system? And a very common example, which nobody, if you ask me, none of us must have thought about it. Today, if Sally wants to know about her portfolio, now, earlier she used to go into that, suppose, bank or the mutual fund site, do the research, put her ID, and then figure out, okay, this much is my investment, and this is how it is. All she has to do is talk to that. Right? Talk to the conversational UI. It will say, okay, these are the portfolios today. This is how the market is doing. And then it will lead towards a decision which you take it for the fact. So what I want to highlight from this slide is, let's not fear, very frankly speaking, let's not fear AI. Let's not fear intelligent automation. This will come. This is here. And this will be complementing each other rather than pushing us out of the system. Let me be blunt about it. AI also cannot survive without human intervention in many spaces of the world. It is a complementary thing, which if I have to take the final gun, all these predictions, the details will come from AI ML side of it. But the final judgment will be the human person who has to do it. And that is where we will talk detail about it. Moving to next slide. And since we are talking about AI, before I thought I'll go into further case studies, I thought, let me just position it, how it is working. And within the entire gamut, what we are talking about, autonomics, AI, ML has been something which is the key enabler into it. And what is ML? It's machine learning. What is machine learning? The fact of the very, in a simple terms, across the verticals, across the geographies, across what uh, the business lines, be it banking, finance, be it insurance, be it your construction organization. I'm going into that kind, mining state part of it the huge amount of data is available, and we all know that. But how to interpret that data, this humongous work has to be done. So what had happened is, industry took a step that what is relevant for me, and these are the guys like you who are experts in it, what is relevant for me, only that data, if I get it, I'm happy. Today, what world is talking about, and what we are saying is, maybe if you go deep into the structure, what was relevant, what you thought earlier, may not be relevant today. And it is your own data. If you go deep into that stuff, that machine learning will draw out inferences, which will help you to take business decisions which are much more ahead than what is required. And that is where it is the game changer, guys. Let me tell you. But how does it work? Now, the fact of the matter is, I'm not an expert who does every day, and I'll come and say, okay, AI, you change the world out of it. I'm one of the guys who wants to be very realistic. There is a supervised learning, in machine learning, there's unsupervised learning, and there's reinforcement learning. And let me set the stage very clearly. There are people like you who are in the industry who know that, okay, if I have X amount of data, which is called the input data, 
my desirable output because i know my industry better my if i am an insurance guy i know what i need to address to my company but the human the data which ever needs to be churned out if i can get help there which is very real faster than the industry what is moving out i am game for it and that is one way of supervised learning wherein and today even to the level what we use it is email for example the kind of email come earlier everybody a human body has to sit and respond to email yes it is easy it is simple you can say but today there are bots who can pick up what needs to be addressed what is key into that and they respond to the factor because why in retail now let me take an example of retail and e-commerce industry time is an essence there are competitors sitting across all websites have the same ability most of the websites have that cognitive ability most of them have chatbots most of them have you know, the kind of structure do you want to lose this youngsters or millennials who don't have patience enough so how do you respond the moment a chatbot somebody comes into a chat and that too and says okay i need to look into an iphone x or b how do you respond to it so that the guy closes the deal with you rather than moving into the other website part of it same as the email part of it if i have given an order that if i have to respond to the order state it has to be immediate bots do it those kind of this is these are supervised learning which you can uh, take part of it then there is unsupervised part of it in unsupervised world you have a historical data set which you put in but in reality you don't have a clear definition of the output which you want to take it further right you want that data set to be churned in such a way that output what it comes out is realistic meaningful for you for example i've given example is product recommend if i have to sell a product suppose in a market and let me take an example of singapore market in singapore if i have to sell to the genex it has to be a product that recommendation has to come from the data churn which is available for whereas if i go into suppose uh, indonesia the product has to be positioned in a different way that which i am not aware of suppose output i am not aware of unsupervised will help me and one very important reference i wanted to highlight which my colleague satish will talk later because there's a detailed poc case study trade finance actually falls in the bucket of both supervised and unsupervised and this is for the banking industry now let me question this and i know all of you are new but we can answer later did banking industry think of the trade finance which has humongous data available humongous manual work to be done will be one of the things which can be taken through machine learning maybe maybe not maybe still all of us are evolving even us for example when i represent hexaware for the time being i'll say we took this step a few months back we said okay why don't we make an attempt to create a poc for one of the largest banks and with satish will give you a, because his excitement i i can't bring back the person who is given birth to the baby we'll talk about that part of it the last point on this is then there comes reinforcement side of it now this is an, another a unique thing which we need to learn into machine learning if we can reinforce through that okay steps taken which was unsupervised taken ahead is the right way of learning out of it it gives us a positive point or a reward kind of stuff so that tomorrow there are certain inferences which we are not aware of can be addressed by the machine and there is a data set which is created day in and day out so here is a scenario where you don't have historical data maybe and it is created out of the real life learning so for example the capital market how does suppose bloomberg go ahead and market and put those even before we get up in the morning and we know okay today's market these are the companies they actually use these kind of setups into part of it so moving to next slide and first two slides may maybe some of you must have felt that what is not talking is just trying to give a reference it is real and this slide is from real life scenarios which is happening across the world and let me be proud about it at be it us be it europe be it apac everywhere this is being utilized i'll give you a few i'll pick up one or two case examples keeping time in mind so fukoku mutual which is one of the insurance company in japan they have done a very unique thing and let me put that in front of you and how it works for one of it so calc and their insurance company calculating payout policy holders everybody knows that rpa in this industry has been working from last two years and everything everything can be done their objective was slightly different their objective was that it's not only cost reduction which i want to do that i want to understand and this problem remains till date in our industry 
that what doctors write, how doctors write, if even 25% of that we can start uh, translating the way it is required in the industry, you don't need that. And that is where the machine learning comes to help. Unstructured data, how do they pull that unstructured data? They bring those part of it. They have brought in learnings from the nurses across who have been working on it and been devolving. What is that? It has to be done to the policyholders. Calculate the payouts. Everything is done and taken back to the industry with a very logical way. And let me tell you, though they saved 30% productivity, though they saved on headcount, but their objective was not that. Their objective was that if I can create an industry standard within this part of the world, how can I evolve it further? And it's a going organization. And let me connect the dots with how the world is taking it further. Any insurance company which is trying to grow further from beyond the market what they are working into, they need to think, do we continue the way my shared services is running or do I bring in automation to bring the step further ahead? And that is where this part of the world will help them to grow also. They do not add again 100 people. Suppose they want to grow in other parts beyond Japan. Suppose they want to come to Singapore. They don't need to add 50 people to address the same policy. All they have to do is bring in machine learning and the growth also happens. People who are in their system have now become experts in guiding the machine. So the data sets which come through are the same guys who are running manually or other. So there is no job loss as such also for the part part of it. Another example which, I'm, uh, which I would like to take and indirectly I talked about was Bloomberg. You see the Credit Suisse one. A Credit Suisse again in the bank BFS world, they have to analyze humongous data and write research reports which needs to be then guided and human also comes into picture. But the reality is all those analysis which had loads of data scientists sitting at the back end, they don't need that much of, uh, it's a human and machine hand in hand going together into that part of the world. Last example which I pick up because Netflix example, all of you know, so I don't need to talk about it, how they have been able to push into system that suppose Pranavai logs into Netflix, it gives me that, okay, Pranav, from last, and without letting me know that these are the kind of the content which is available for your visualization. And because they know my trend, they know my liking and disliking, they have been pushing that. And naturally, I jump into and start looking at it. But an example of Tesco is another very unique one, which all of you should look at it. And this is an example, which is a company which didn't jump into AI and ML immediately. They were, they were not the guys who are into it. They are into retail, we all know about it. They waited for the industry to mature. They didn't go ahead the, the way, suppose Amazon has gone into their part of the world. But what have they done different? Right, IFTT, it's a unique name they have given. It means that if that done this, right? Now what does that mean for them is, they went deep into it, any customer who logs into suppose online and this comes, orders like we all order and there's a regular pattern that suppose uh, Mr. X is coming from Vietnam and hitting uh, the, uh, the, these are the uh, items I need. Again, after 15 days, the same person is coming and out of that even 70% of the line items are same. They are trying to go back through their machine learning and tell them that you don't need to bother, you just pick up. Now, if you have, suppose a UI conversational like Alexa or Google Home, just talk to it, let us know how it is, we will start pushing back into the system even before we ship it to you. And okay, do you need ABCD which you regularly need? Here is the stock available near your house. This is the shop which we will ship it to you. That kind of leverage they started doing it to. And the interesting fact is, across Europe, this is slowly, steadily picking up. And they have now become, the company which is a retail one have now become an example of that yes, machine learning can be brought in. They use IBM Watson as a platform on the back end, and they have done a very good job out of it. So some of these examples what I'm raising is, may not be from the industry from you come from, but the fact is, did we assume that six, eight months back or a year and a half back, these will be real? I don't think so, most of us will agree to it, that what it was happening, but it is happening. Uber, no use talking about it, it is much ahead, all of you know about it. Now, now, if we are talking about it, if industry is doing it, advisors also are interested in it, right? And uh, I'm not a part of fraternity of advisor, but what are they talking? And see an interesting point to which McKinsey says is, 
85, 85%, they did a research, 85% of the respondents out of it, 900 plus processes in their firms can be automated. Now, that, they didn't mean it. If you read the entire report, they have never talked about people automation. What they are talking about, and this is where the relevance of RPA, RPA++, what I mean by RPA++ is before machine learning coming into picture, so a lot of stuff like OCR comes into picture, email automation we talk about comes into picture, that kind of thing. Any process today, and I'll try to give you a very uh, live example, can have 25, suppose if a process has 25 steps into it. Now, automation doesn't mean that entire 25 steps will get automated everywhere. Then somebody, if somebody is claiming that that person doesn't understand this industry. Automation means that within those, there can be, suppose, 12 steps, seven steps out of 25, which either a bot through RPA can do it, certain activities, machine learning uh, uh, software will do it, and human being comes into, well, if there's a judgment to be taken, human being comes into it, there are some places where you have to follow the norms, the industry, the country specific norms, which Satish will talk very specific later. It has to be done. That is where it comes into that. There is a space for us to work together. It's like, I call it, it's a marriage. Now to make it successful, we can decide we, we don't need it, either I don't marry, or I go ahead and divorce within a year. But the fact is, this segment or this industry of marriage is similar to this part of the world. It has to go hand in hand. Another example before I move on, which is 59% of the executives PwC talks about say, big data at the company would be improved through the use of AI. That means it's not just top down, bottoms up kind of story. Everybody, and I'll give an example. We are a company of just 13,500 out of which I represent 5,000 folks, which is the BPS side. The mandate we have taken is 50% of my workforce has to be digital. Now, what does it mean? In the, initially, everybody said, okay, that, are you going to reduce the headcount? I mean, no, I will go much faster than the industry standard, but my headcount will not be commensurate to the way I'm growing, so to the growth part of it. That is real automation, and I have to eat my own pudding first of all. So today, when I recruit, for example, entire recruitment of my BPS is done through a bot. We have created various scenarios wherein initial, everybody knows that, okay, a CV can be screened and all those stuff, which is very simple, bot can handle it. But even screening the candidate, going back and searching about his background verification, I'll talk about a case later if I get time, Everything is done through the bot and we move from there. This slide, I will not dwell too much because this is more, but the fact which I want to help understand is, if you see the list of drop downs, and we have picked a few industries, there are other industries available, verticals available, it's just a start. Way back in banking industry, if I had gone and talked to somebody, Payments, inquiries, investigation, we'll think about machine learning. I would have been pushed out, and actually I had been pushed out. There, I, I remember when I was uh, working four years back in Singapore, people were willing to automate and go to Iskandar and Max, but putting an automation bot said, first make me understand how, how will it handle, and now everybody is talking about it. For example, Vietnam, they have gone ahead and they have done that. They have shown uh, the banking industry that they were the first runners in APAC to address that part of it. Insurance. The fact, when I'm talking here, and I'll, I'll talk later sometime, majority of the organizations are even using automation and rather the data scientists are working behind it to improve the sales part of it. So we have customer service. Customer service is taken for granted. If you don't bring in automation, you are the laggard part of it. Telecom worldwide has been a success into it. And one of the examples which I have uh, about, and it's very simple, I'll talk about it is, in telecom industry, there are places where suppose somebody has not paid and you have to verify that is, can I give, because they're, they're, it is very easy to switch, right? So you want to hold on to the customer, you want to reduce churn, but you want to ensure the person pays also, what is his uh, payment ability and all those stuff. We have introduced automation there, and now we are talking, it was initially RPA, where the bot goes, even it takes a decision, so it's RPA plus plus, that okay, should I give this person 10 plus days on his past history if he's there with me to give that payment, make that payment? And if the person doesn't make the payment, even the bot takes the decision to go and knock off the customer. Initially, we didn't do that for a year and a half. When my customers saw benefit out of it, they have allowed that to happen. 
So there are various scenarios uh, into which manufacturing, believe you me, took time to kickstart, right? Retail was the first mover. But today, if I talk about specific to APAC, and now I'm seeing Europe also in automation, and especially in the auto industry, they are becoming pioneers in AI and ML side of it. So it, it is example, and, and I'm keeping time in mind, I'm moving ahead. We can talk later in the Q&A. Next slide. So uh, you can come back and say, Pranav, you have been talking about it, that what is there? Or just have you done it? Or is there a real example? I took Sally's name and gave you the virtual portfolio manager has actually been built and it is working in this slide. But if you see on the left side of it, how in insurance industry the game changer can happen and how customer experience improves it. All I, if I have a smartphone, I, I know my win number of my car. My chassis number, I just take the number. If I have meet with an accident, I click that through an app and if you see the quick code, I immediately get all details, my, my insurance company starts responding. You don't need to come back home and start or make calls and to make it happen and things happen. More important is, and this case study talks about slightly different. Mr. Pranavrai was driving. He didn't remember that his, it was due for renewal. And today, 22nd was my due for renewal. 23rd, I realized I have not done my renewal. Do I need to go into office and log into, log into web and all those stuff and then renew? Standing where I am, I can renew there with my phone, app available, the phone and with this click of bin number, I can renew my insurance policy. That is where the experience changes because as in, otherwise I had an option of searching for others who's giving me a better rate and all those stuff, whereas this has given me immediate impact out of it. Travel industry is going in that. So I'm not going into various discussion. What I'd like to highlight, the one which I can see here is visa appointment. And we do this, this is real. In visa appointment, there are many aspects in different parts of the world, there are different processes to be followed. Chatbots have come really handy that rather than I can fix an appointment, I'll know that, okay, 2.30 window is available today or maybe for tomorrow, what all documents are required. You finish off everything before you reach if you are supposed to be uh, maybe face to face and you take care from there. That is where the future of experience is there and that is where uh, the world is moving. So there are two or three examples. Now I'll take up uh, one or two and then my colleague Satish will pick up quickly. Uh, first one, and this is very interesting because there are ways to think of, right? When there was nothing, there was no AI and ML, this case study, which I'm talking about, it is, we call it digital verification as a service. Now, this is like background verification. Most of us, and in today's world, millennials, you know, they keep changing jobs. So you have to do background verification checks and in some parts of the world, it is a mandate. You have to do, do ABCD things. We were running a shop with around 280 people for years, for around five years when automation was not there. I'm talking about those days. The moment automation creeped in, we realized, and because this is all the learning which we cropped up through serving the customer, what do we do? We go into, suppose, five or six specific websites, we search for the person's name, phone number, whom to contact, what to contact. Then we decide when to call his ex organization, what are the things we need to call, or we go and it was done. So there was a research to be done. There was a calling to be done. And my client, who was a background verification, their end customers had different SOPs, standard operating process. So the complexity was every end customer of my customer had different SOP part of it. When we brought in automation here, we created complete, it was a risk we took. We decided, okay, we don't give back to industry. How will we, we recognize that we are the automators of the world? We went back to the customer saying, 280, we will bring it down to sub 100. We will introduce automation wherein the bot will do the research. Initially, it was a dumb bot. It was meant to simply go on the website and check what it is. Later on, it started taking some decision in a sense, do I need to call? Or can I simply go and then we create another bot which is called online bot. The decision taken was I don't need to call it rather. In some of the cases, I will go into the website and clear it off online. And the other complexity of creating new SOPs every time, again, it is done through a bot. Interesting aspect out of this is entire segment got changed for my customer. Within one and a half years, we, we had a loss of revenue for that. 
that my end my customer got five new clients and the, because of this relationship and the confidence in us we also have now run back to around 180 plus 200 plus so whatever i lost through automation i so for a period i guess i did that the customer has gained a lot so i don't want to talk about that because all of us understand how much reduction of effort and all those the reality is this is the partnership which automation will bring in this was more on the initial part. The second and, uh, and uh, case study is very unique. Here is a, this is RPA plus 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 OCR and this is a cognitive OCR. Here is a case wherein a contract management system for a pharma industry in Europe is completely, and the, the fact the biggest challenge they were facing was they were, the, these contracts work with experts of pharma industry, right? These are scientists. Who don't have patience you know if if i'm a knowledge worker i act pricey right it is real that's all these guys didn't have patience to sign those read those contracts come into those complexities that we don't close it today and these are freelance uh, data scientists so they would go and connect with other pharma companies and you lose a major knowledge part all these contracts the company wanted to close immediately rather than the time what they were taking a part of it we introduced the concept of Starting from email automation, which was a kind of a machine learning, which I talked about it earlier, with NLP coming to picture, introduced OCR and bot, and it was cognitive that it has to read the session. Finally, again a bot came into picture. We said, okay, since now that my end client client is happy, but my client had to log into Ariba system, which most of you are familiar with in the contract. Why do somebody, human, a person need to go and then log into Ariba and create a contract? Why can't the bot create out of it? So the entire life cycle of starting interaction with the scientists, getting into the space wherein we have to do our backend and again fitting into Ariba so that the, the sequence and everything is taken care of immediately, it brought it sub 30. In a 90 minutes kind of AC came down to sub 30. And today where we stand, we are at sub 15 minutes kind of reduction. So this is if was done and this case was presented back to the suppliers across the world. I'll hand over now to Satish for the most exciting story of the day. Let me honestly pick it up because we never thought a year and a half back that trade finance can be created on a machine learning platform. So Satish, all yours. Thanks, Prana. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good morning. Uh, uh, this is an interesting case study where uh, we have done this for one of the largest global banks in the world. And this is a part of our, uh, you know, initial pursuit for a very, very large opportunity. And customer asked us to kind of, you know, when we, when we really solution for uh, trade finance, they asked us to uh, just do OCR of the, of the trade documents. I think that was like a challenge to all the vendors, right? And that was given to us as well. Um, while we were building the OCR solution for this particular uh, visit for the customer, we realized that we can do actually more, uh, you know, when we have scanned the documents uh, for trade. And in the process, our uh, CTO really helped us kind of think about, uh, can we use machine learning here? Can we use RPA? And the team really worked around uh, with the solution and created a, you know, a discovery kind of a solution, which currently uh, is a use case that you can really resemble with uh, onboarding in any of your uh, insurance banking operations, where you have tons of documents coming in to onboard customer. Uh, just a quick background about this operation. Uh, this is a trade uh, finance operations where, you know, you have, when you do an export, um, the exporter needs to submit a set of documents uh, with the LC. Um, LC is uh, generally a payment instrument between an import and exporter. You know, importers pay through LC and exporter uh, ship the product to importer. Now, uh, whenever an LC and the supporting documents are submitted in a bank, uh, these documents need to be matched. And approximately banks capture, you know, at least this global bank was capturing almost 90 uh, set of uh, variables from all these set of documents. And then matching them for uh, accuracy, matching them for uh, compliance, matching them for uh, uh, the true trade, and then processing it further. Now, in the current scenario, uh, when we were doing due diligence, we realized, uh, you know, people in operations really have, you know, holding one uh, LC in one hand, checklist on the other hand, and uh, other set of documents on the table, right? Uh, almost 13 to 14 set of documents on the table. And then started, uh, uh, you know, checking for different uh, variables in different set of documents. Now this is, uh, you know, in today's world, I think I have not seen this um, in many of the operations in banking and in this banking side of the world, 
but this is very, very, uh, you know, uh, true witness of uh, manual operations. And that's where uh, we really looked into, you know, how can we really automate? And uh, what we suggested is to really start with the very basic, which is to use an OCR uh, effectively. And uh, for this particular solution, because we wanted to show a proof of concept, we use Google OCR to run the OCR on the uh, set of documents, uh, the trade documents, and captured uh, you know maximum amount of data from the uh, supporting an LC. LC is mostly structured. It's only 46A and 47A, which is unstructured. However, that 46A and 47A also makes the most of the terms and conditions in the LC, uh, which needs to be matched with the supporting document. Uh, so our first step was to really do a OCR and get the documents converted into digital form uh, and the text. Uh, the second step was to really process now, right? Really match, you know, uh, details with the, say for an example, BL number needs to be available on, uh, you know, a certain set of documents. Uh, LC number needs to be available on all the documents, right? If it says that in the LC terms and conditions. So the employee needs to, or maker really needs to go into each set of documents and check uh, if the details are matching, you know, line by line, character by character, number by number, right? And it, it was taking more than one and a half hours to really do a maker checker job. Um, and what we realized is this is the scope where we can really automate. And that's where we implemented our solution around uh, uh, really automating the maker by bringing in OCR, which is a cognitive OCR. Uh, reading through the documents, capturing characters and variables from the document, and then handing over to Checker. Now Checker is doing uh, more, uh, you know, uh, operations of eyeball check, uh, but because there's an element of machine learning here, which we bring in, uh, that is to really match the documents, right? So machine learning, what is doing, you know, if you remember this, if you really visualize what I just said about a few minutes back, so that people were really, ha you know, doing this check uh, with documents on the table. Uh, now, this was now converted where a machine learning was now looking at these variables and uh, making checks, uh, you know, checking each and every variable in different set of documents. Um, now, we realized that the maker job itself uh, reduced to, uh, you know, in a simulated environment. We realized that the maker job really is, uh, you know, eliminated by almost 60 to 70 percent, whereas the checker job required to do this job now was only 50 percent. Um, and we did, we did almost 100 simulations in one of the BPMS tool that we use to uh, validate our solutions. And um, the, the study was amazing, right? And when we showed it to the customer, you know, customer realized that they see this serious value in this kind of operations. And uh, as we speak today, we may be doing, you know, a quick due diligence to uh, really show this to, you know, in the real working scenario, you know, from a prototype uh, version. Uh, the capability also brings in to do anti-money laundering figures, OFAC checks, sanction checks, because once you have data available in text format from a scanned copy, you can really now throw this to do a lot more than what you can think, you know, with the, the text data available. And uh, that is the potential that we see in the solution today. And, uh, and, and the benefit that we really uh, uh, see from, from this particular solution emerging is a real automation towards the maker job. And, uh, you know, maker was like our prime focus for last two years. But machine learning really brings in capability to also create capacity in the checker's job. And almost 50% of the checker's job is automated by machine learning intervention and decision making. Uh, this also reduces our 40% of uh, cost of ownership for the customer, uh, because most of these are very human intense processes, uh, and people just throw bodies to do the job if they have volumes, which can be now addressed by uh, this web uh, app that we have developed for the trade finance operations. Um, and this, you know, if, if you're in a different industry where you're doing banking, you're doing insurance, you're doing capital markets, you're doing, uh, you know, corporate banking, uh, the only thing I want you to really take back is the potential, uh, you know, once you're able to convert a physic, you know, physical document to scan and scan to text and what you can really do with it. Uh, and that is a, you know, proof of concept this case study really bring, you know, brings you back. Thanks, Satish. And this brings, uh, us to the end of our presentation, and what I want to leave uh, with before I hand over to Sally is our objective as an Hexaware, as a 607 million organization, is automate everything, cloudify everything, and transform customers. Beyond this, we don't want to attempt anything, and this is where we want to live as well. Thanks, everyone. Sally, back to you for the QA. Thank you so much, the um, Hexware team. That was really, really interesting. Exactly what I hoped for, very, very practical, um, which is, is just the insight that um, our 
uh, members and our delegates really need. Um, just a reminder to the attendees listening, um, please write your questions into the Q&A box or to the chat and we'll endeavor to get those answered. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first one, how do you define which technology to use for any processes? Um, you know, whether it's RPA or machine learning or AI, what's the process and methodology behind selecting that? So, Sally, I have my expert, Vidhi, why don't you respond to this question? So, to identify which methodology, what is the methodology that we use to identify what processes to be automated or which technology to use, we begin with prioritizing the processes depending on three factors. The operational complexity, which involves parameters such as frequency of upgrades in your system, handoffs between humans, robots. Then we look at the risk part of it, which is what are the legal regulatory risks involved? What, what will happen if the cost, what is the cost of bot failure? What are the number of FTAs and volumes impacted when uh, there is a missed SLA? We also look at the process complexity, which includes the stability of the process, frequency of exceptions, uh, involvement of structured and unstructured data. All of these parameters are rated on a scale of one to five, where one is the lowest complexity and five being the highest. We analyze and assess which processes should be automated depending on these parameters, which processes should not be automated, which processes should be automated but after standardization, where is it that we need to involve machine learning and where is it where we need to drive invasive technology changes. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is, and um, sorry before we go to the next question is, I just remember this word, where it is must have, there is, that is the place to go with AI. Good to have is not the term, at least for us. Yeah, yeah, Sally, back to yeah, you. Yeah, that sounds really um, very logical, very methodical um, way to choose, which I know will appeal to a lot of people listening. Um, can they find out more about that if they approach your booth or if they contact you directly? Sure, you're, you're welcome about it. Great, great. Okay, the next question that's come in is from Shrija, um, and they ask, um, you know, for intelligent automation, do you have any examples where AI, sorry, well, AI or intelligent automation has been linked with um, product analytics? So across customer records for review, after sales, complaints, product recalls. Can you talk a little bit more about the analytics side of, of you know, the benefits of these technologies? So that's a good question and uh, we have it, but let me give an example if it can uh, help. This is from a uh, turbojet engine organization, worldwide one of the biggest ones. Now what they currently do is, and they, they are the manufacturers of the biggest uh, uh, turbines and engines which are used in aircraft. So earlier, maximum revenue for them was coming from selling those uh, engines and turbines, part of it. Today, how they change the product line, and I'll give an example, their business of services gives them more than 50% of their revenue out of it. And why did they change that? Through AI ML, they realized the world is moving in a different pattern. And even though the sale of the product was there, it was obviously throughout the world it will happen. But they realized the kind of margins, the product for them to sustain in market has to be different. And what they brought was, they brought managed service model into the structure. Earlier, they used to charge for a product, and then there was service charge of around 8%, 9%. Today, when they go to customer, they say, you don't need to worry about it. If that airline, if that flight is in air, I will only charge you for that period for maintenance. Now, see what has happened here. So one, as a users, large airlines of the world, they realize majority of the times, if the flight is not in air, they have to pay for maintenance. That is gone, number one. Second, what they have come out is that as and when the product, see the product enhancement, as and when there is an upgrade or development, I will, and this is old model coming from software, I will enable that product for you, but the maintenance period will be the fact, factor which I'll keep charging on that above it. So the change in the product line was that I'm not pushing just my product. I am pushing a managed service model through a charge that, okay, my current revenue may go down a little bit, but slowly, and all this, they got 
through that machine learning data, what they was captured by those slides only that when it is in air, there's maximum depletion or depreciation was happening. That is the period where I can help my customer. I've done my job. When it is not in air, there's only certain person which I can take as a hit. So it's a partnership model which they have involved and it's available across. So this is worldwide acceptable. And from our side of the case study, he gave a very good example that trade finance, he showed that, okay, how you serve. And a new product line which has come out for banks by this is, and this is how you need to think, that suppose there are 10 clients of mine who come to me for LCs every month, or suppose 700 LCs per month. Uh, if the LC gets stuck somewhere, they have to pay $100 across. Now, uh, if I go back through AI and ML and tell my clients that because in these scenarios, majority of your LC gets stuck because of the errors which you have made or because of your end customer or the buyer not providing you details, if you rectify this, you will save X amount of it. It's a new product line for banks to go and sell it. So that is what we are taking it to the market. And the earlier one is worldwide, it's written everywhere. I hope that answers the question, Sally. Yes, very much. Thank you for, for your thorough answer that definitely um, gives us some food for thought. Um, next question that's coming in, and we'll just have time for two more questions. So um, write your questions in. The next question um, is, can you talk about the impact of chatbots and machine learning models? Um, by when can I see the benefits of machine learning? That's a good one. Yeah. You want to take it, Vidi? Yeah. I'll hand over to Vidi. Yeah, I'll take that question up. So the impact of machine learning algorithms or chatbots or any intelligent automation use case is highly dependent on the training data set that is fed into the algorithm. This training data set ensures that your processes relearn and it helps you to recalibrate your process along with the confidence level that you have defined. If a training data set covers all process scenarios and the algorithm is able to deliver a confidence level which is uh, say above 80 to 85 percent, then we're looking at a timeline between three to six months for your uh, bots or your algorithm to pass on the ROI. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just add, and, and Sally, because the other part of the question is how real is it? So, in customer service part of the world, and if we go now into it, it's actually been utilized. And I have been talking about insurance, insurance a lot earlier, and Satish talked about banking. In insurance, Today, to segment demography-wise, that okay, suppose in Australia, in parts of Sydney and in parts of uh, Melbourne, the demography changes, right? To address that, where do I position a chatbot, right? Through machine learning. The, the Gen X part will address it, or the next generation, I need to position that. So we are thinking on those lines. Actually, this is visible, available in market. You bring in products through machine learning, which go and identify with that segment of the user. So one of the days that you just put in a chatbot and you, you're happy about it, or everybody will use it. Nobody will use it. You will not even get your returns out of it. Whereas if you segment the market and position it through machine learning, it is becoming real. It is working and I've seen it, Singtel does it, Optus is making it happen for future and Telstra is there. Across the world it's happening. So I'm just giving you a few examples for us. But they also had to fine tune it through machine learning model. Mm -hmm. Hope this answers the question. Yes, yeah, great, thank you, um, definitely. Um, and our last question um, will be around, let me just have a look. Um, what algorithms and OCR technology um, was used for the trade finance example that you gave? Satish. So uh, for the OCR, um, we use Google OCR, which is a cognitive OCR, right, which is also a cloud-based solution. Uh, and for the machine learning, we use the Google Dialogflow, uh, which is again a cloud-based solution. And uh, both was leveraged to you know, develop this POC for the customer in a very, very short time. It's very mm -hmm. handy you know, if you really want POC for a customer. Yeah. And right. the algorithm uh, which you guys were talking about it, as I said, it is a mixture of unsupervised and supervised, right? And this was the supervised, if I go to algorithms that are supervised, multiple are like KN, decision free, random forest was taken uh, into that. And on the unsupervised side of it, clustering model was also brought into picture. So uh, that's that's what I would like to call it, like hierarchy structure. Excellent, excellent. Um, 
Okay, well that wraps up today's session. Um, thank you to um, all of the Hexware team for joining us. Um, if you want to chat with them further, they are in the exhibition hall. You can click on their booth to connect with them or to download any of the um, collateral that they've been talking about today. Um, and they'll also in the chat room if you strike up a conversation with them um, with any questions that we weren't able to answer. And just some brief notes from me before I let you all go. Um, so that was our final session for today. Um, just want to recap quickly. Um, first, we heard from Lauren Lisa Coleman. She's a digi digicultural trend analyst and contributor for Forbes on the future trends and AI. Um, she looked at what to watch for as future workplace ethics and machine and machines massively converge. Next up, we had robotics and finance and accounting um, for the black line. That was a really, really interesting and practical presentation. Um, following this, we had industrializing and tracking your RPA program through the RPA balance scorecard with edge verb emphasis. Um, and last but not least, we had the Hexware team with embracing intelligent automation, a step change towards smarter operations. Um, tomorrow's our final day and we have some really exciting presentations I know that you won't want to miss. Um, just two sessions tomorrow, um, kickstarting at 10.30 a.m. Singapore time with Abhishek Verma. He's a Vice President and APAC Lead for Operational Excellence at Credit Suisse. Um, and he's going to be looking at launching RPA pilot projects, proof of concept and result analysis. Um, and then we'll be ending with um, um, Morty. Um, Morty is the SCP. SVP for Global Business Services for Olam International, and he'll be talking about their story in building a 100% in-house team, um, Olam's adoption path and plan to grow RPA. Okay, um, so once again, you can join us in the networking room, um, in the chat, otherwise I will see you back here in the morning. Thank you. Thank you to my audience and thank you Sally and team. Take care guys.